Welcome to the Garage Network Podcast. Join us and the occasional special guest as we discuss everything automotive, from fixing cars as a technician, owning an automotive workshop or business, overall work-life balance, and even the occasional laugh. In this episode of TG and Talks, we sit down with Gary Arian. We talk about his time in the dealership world as a diagnostic technician and how his career is now evolving, from running his own business to teaching the future techs of our trade. So let's get into it. I think we'll start with a bit about, well, let us know a little bit about you, I guess. Like I know obviously you've been a tech, dealer tech for, as, as much far as I know, you've always been a dealer tech. I don't know though. Um, no. You know, I'm sure a lot of the guys in the network sort of see you pop up all the time. You're probably one of the biggest contributors on the page. You're really Definitely trying to win was. that, um, trying to win that um, the TGN <laughs> prize. So, um, you know, where'd you get started? You know, why mechanic, all that sort of stuff. Um, yep. So, I'll, I'll I'll just jump in there for a sec. So, I probably was one of the biggest contributors on TGN, but now that I not in a workshop all the time. I'm definitely not exposed to as much stuff. Um, just, you know, crappy um, apprentice cars, but, you know, well, that's a different story. <laughs> they can't afford to fix them. <laughs> um, so my, sto- my starting story is probably a bit different than everyone else or most other people. I, so I finished year 12 and with, with literally absolutely no interest in cars whatsoever. I just could not care less. Just... I just had absolutely no interest. And so I had to get a job. So the, the choice in the newspaper was either wash cars at a local Toyota or get an apprenticeship at the local Ford and Kia, Ford, Kia and Subaru dealer at the time. And um, I thought, well, yeah, mechanics are stupid, so I'll get the apprenticeship and I'll have a piece of paper at the end of it. Um, I would have made a lot more money in the first three years washing cars, but... Um, you know, I'm still I'm glad I got the apprenticeship. So that was in that was at the end of 2010 that I got the apprenticeship, and I don't know how I got it. Well, I do actually. One of the guys I work with now, who's a, who's also a teacher, he um he I was his apprentice, and he went to school with my brother. So I think he played a big part in me actually getting the job because I, like I said, I had no knowledge and no interest at all in cars. Not the best way to start an interview. I don't like cars. I don't know anything about them, but give me a job. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, well, I, I distinctly remember the guy from. Um, I was I was signed up through AGT training. Um, I distinctly remember him coming around to my house and showing me some pictures, saying, "Okay, so what's this part? And what's this part?" Now I know it was like a valve and a piston, and I was like, at the time, I was like, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what that is. Um, but yeah. Uh, so I think the guy's name that we'll work with now is Chris. I think he had a big, um, he played a big part in me actually getting the job. Um, so yeah, that was in 2000, the end of 2010 that I started the apprenticeship. Um, the first three years were, uh, they were, they were all right. They were, they definitely weren't, as you can see as my, with my input on TGN when I pretty, uh, I, I defend dealerships a fair bit it's because most of people's opinion on the dealership is you just sweep and um, just do nothing for the first few years but that definitely wasn't my experience um, like I was changing heads on Subarus and you know, taking engines and gearbox and stuff out and just, just sometimes by myself sometimes with somebody so it was I, you know I obviously swept and cleaned and stuff but it wasn't that wasn't my main role um, so yeah that the apprenticeship was, well, my whole career so far has been through uh, a Ford, Kia, and when I first started, it was a Subaru dealership. So until about 2013, in 2013, when I finished the apprenticeship, um, just before I finished, I did my uh, refrigerant handling licence course. Um, and, yeah, I... Yeah, I finished the apprenticeship and had the AC course and thought, yeah, I, I pretty much know it all. I'm, I'm pretty good. Um, and As we all do, yeah, I'm qualified. Yeah, I'm the king. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was pretty good. So I, I went through another another year or two thinking I was, you know, I'm, pr- I'm a bit of a top dog here. I, I know it all. Um, then 
we got rid of Subaru, who it depends who you talk to, we got rid of Subaru, lost Subaru, whichever one you want to go with. I'll say got rid of. Um, <laughs> we got rid of Subaru. And um, and then we started to do more. Well, I didn't really do much. We started to do more um, accessory fitting. So we became an Iron Man dealer as well. Um, so bull bars and tow bars and lights and things like that. And second batteries and stuff. Um, and then, did you find? Uh, so just to interrupt real quick. Did you did you find that due to you being sort of exposed to a lot of those bigger jobs early on? Do you reckon that's what kept you going in the trade? Do you reckon you would have gotten bored of if you were, let's say, oh, yeah, know, put on to one, t- one job a day, like one you know, task a week if you yep. just had to sweep and just change oil? Yeah, so I, w- I will backtrack slightly. So when I say I was doing engines and stuff, that well, definitely wasn't all the time. It was just occasionally. Yeah. So the majority of the time I would have been doing servicing, same as most mm-hmm. dealers, I suppose. Uh, I, def- I definitely didn't do, I, well, hardly any diagnostics I didn't even know what that was, to be honest. So yeah. no idea what that was. You just service a car or you replace an engine, that's it. Um, but yeah, I, I got pretty sick of doing services pretty quickly. So if it wasn't for those those bigger jobs, I, I am definitely wouldn't have, I don't know what I would have done, to be honest. Yeah. I, I guess I guess in saying that, like, I, my perception of a dealer is, is not that guys are sweeping the floor all the time. I think that's, there's a bit of method to that and, and I can... You know, our first years that even coming to our workshop, um, I think I've spoken to Costa about this, and I don't know if you've heard me, Gary. We talk about those little jobs, being able to put things away, being able to take things out of the room and clean the room and put them back in the same place yep. is really, really important for your um, it's important skills for them to be learning in that first year. That they have the aptitude to do pull something off a car and remember where it went back to. Yeah, you know, that's I've right. sacked a couple, I, I, I've not sacked, but we've, 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 we've performance managed, tried to performance manage a couple of apprentices who just don't have that ability. And, and you just go, I'm sorry, this is just not going to work. It's not the job for you. If you can't take things off a shelf and half an hour later dust that shelf, put those things back on that shelf or remove things from the room, clean the floor, and put things back in the same place where they were, then you're not going to have that sort of, you don't have the aptitude for the trade. And I think that's a really, they, yeah. they, they are, I don't know whether that's what goes on in the dealership, but that's what we do in, in the independent world. And I think you're really lucky that you've been in a, in a, in a, probably a rural, what dealership you're in, you're in a, in a rural dealership. Yeah. 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 Pretty rural. Yeah. Yeah. So I think you're lucky in that instance that, um, you know, you probably had, I've got a couple of guys that have been dealer trained who have never, they hardly did a clutch. Yeah, right. The only jobs that came through, goes through most of the city dealerships are services. I think, yeah. yeah, but like, I, I, what I think, Mike, and that's very, um, just like the independence that, like, to be fair, like the independence, I know some shops that, that don't even, what's their, don't, don't allow the, their, the early guys to do anything about services either. I think that's not one of a, it's more of a per, Per company basis, I think more yeah. than it is a, a you know what they do, what what independence do. I think it's a little bit more company policy. If that makes sense, you know. Well, I, I guess every- that I guess that segues to what, where's the where's. The, I mean, I, I don't get this whole dealership versus independent argument. The rivalry have. doesn't make sense. The rivalry does. We'll get, I think we'll get to that. Yeah, yeah. But I'm, uh, I mean that 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 that's. Uh, but I, there's no certainly from our perspective, there's no rivalry. We're, it's probably more about perception. And about the guys that we get in to go, oh, I've never done a timing build, I've never done a timing chain, and they've worked in a dealer for seven years. And, and, and in the city, that's probably because they're not exposed, that they don't get the opportunity to do those jobs. That's mm-hmm. it's all about. I mean, you can have a guy working at Bob Jane who's 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 a, a, a third year mechanic or qualified mechanic who's never done anything but tires and fit batteries. Yeah. yeah. We um in you know, in my area, we're surrounded by mines so a, a lot of people do light and heavy vehicle minor apprenticeships and some of them some of them are clever um uh, as i smile after i say that um <laughs> but I, was, I was watching that the problem is they're at the mine so everything gets you know everything gets rusted and needs replacing every five minutes and um 
the mine has an endless budget. So, you know, if the if this yeah. if this bush and control arm starts rusting, you don't replace the bush or whatever, you just replace the whole assembly because that costs you know four thousand dollars, but you know, the mine doesn't care, they'll just throw four thousand dollars at it or they'll just replace the car or so you know they don't they don't do a lot of diagnosing or anything like that. Yeah, Costing so they not, yeah. yeah, there's not really a a limit to what they can just replace. Oh, you know, the engine's blown up. We aren't rebuilding or anything. We'll just we'll just chuck that Land Cruiser out and get another one. So, so on that as well, you said diagnostics. So you obviously went from a lot of your videos that you do put up are quite um clever. Thank you. For a word, better word. Um, My what, head getting bigger as you say that. Yeah, we, we, Dara, we'll pop it later on. We'll try. We'll try and build you up before you knock you down. <laughs> No, nah, never. Um, so what, what made you want to start going down that path? Because I did dare say it's probably harder to sort of get away with. Um, I'm guessing time that they give you in a dealership to do that sort of work is a bit tighter. Yeah. So what, what, what made you um, want to do that path? So the, the um, I think it was 2019 or something. That's the same year I actually joined TGN. Mm-hmm. Um, I, the service manager at my work, uh, that had been there the whole time I was there, left. And so occasionally I took over for him if he was on holidays or something. And so I took his job, which I, I'm not going to do that again. Um, he, um, you know, a part of the agreement of that was that I'm allowed to do a, a training course, which was the Certificate 3 in Auto Electrical. Um, so I went and did that. And like I said before, I, I thought I knew everything and then i went to that training course and i was just like oh my god how have i survived in this trade not knowing how all of these things work this is crazy <laughs> well they just like an electrical add-on to your yeah. mechanical yeah right it was it was certificate three but it was like that that flexi trade so it's just a year's worth of the courses yeah. that i didn't do some of them like ignition systems and stuff i chose to do just because i wanted to see an auto electrical take on on something that I already learned in in light vehicle, and yeah. it was just complete. The way it was explained was just completely different. Like it was it was really well, really well done. Yeah, nice. Um, and yeah, that that got me into understanding a lot of things a lot better. So I I started to gain a lot more interest in that way. So that's what got me down the diagnostic path. And so because I started thinking that way, I was like, oh, I'll join all these groups. And then I got on to TGN, and I was this isn't me trying to. You know, kiss ass or anything, but I got on there and I thought, oh, hey, well, I know all this sort of electrical stuff. I'll blow these guys away. And I was like, oh my god, now I'm an idiot here too. Jesus. <laughs> hey, that's all right. That's how if it makes you feeling, but that's how we all feel. I think. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like the, I know everything until. <laughs> yeah, everyone on the TGN group is just like such an overachiever. It's ridiculous. <laughs> oh my god, it makes you sick, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. <laughs> You don't. You just realise you don't know everything, and you just got to You learn every day, and, and yeah. one of those. You're always learning. I mean, I've been doing this for thirty years, and you just you learn every day. Mm. Ask someone. My dad. My dad been doing it. You know, he's eighty, so you know, you just go. He's been doing it since he was sixteen, and he loved learning every day. Well, you know? I don't know about you guys. If I see some new stuff that I don't know, which I, I think I should know, it makes me want to learn that thing. So yeah. now, when you see some guys, it's a pretty cool. Tests and tricks. I think it's pretty, um, you know, it's pretty encouraging to make you want to go and try yourself. I'm still chuffed about getting bearings with the bearings off with the hubs out with the bloody. How simple is it? Spinning a hub. And yeah, how simple is it? It falls off and go. Yeah. What have I been doing for thirty years? <laughs> Hammering chisel for the last thirty years. Yeah, I've got bits of metal in my yeah, arm. But- <laughs> you know, like, what am I doing? And then Hello. it's so easy. Yeah. The um the th- the one test that got me into the diagnostic and, and scoping stuff was um was at the auto electrical course we I did my very first relative compression test with an amp clamp yeah. and I just I just flashed back to the four hundred times that I could have used that and gone oh my god oh, that, that's honestly oh. that, that's what got yeah. me on to even wanting to worry yeah. about what a scope was was that one test yeah that's exactly yeah it just just opened a whole world of that's just saved like. It saved me thousands of hours retrospectively, but just, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, the amount of the amount of non-invasive testing that yeah. you know for all the stuff that we've pulled apart that you could just go, oh my god! Like, yeah, I mean, my my favorite tool still to this day is a vacuum gauge. Oh, 
I'm, I'm gradually that. moving over to the to the um, uh, to the to the um, in cylinder uh, pressure transducer, but but I still love you know my my vacuum gauge is my number two test tool. Yeah, look, mm. I agree, I'll agree with that. I'll agree with that. So it's up there. It's one of the things that we grab with a with a an ignition system tester, a, a, a fuel pressure tester, and a vacuum gauge. They're the Give me those three things and, a, and, a, and an incandescent volt voltmeter, <laughs> or incandescent sorry voltmeter, incandescent uh, test light, um, and and a, and I'm away. You're right. So you know. Yep. The basics never die. The they, basics well, no, never no. die. All we ever do is reinvent the wheel in this industry. That's what we do. Ex- except with maybe the electric vehicles. I don't know how you're going to get a vacuum gauge to work on one of those. Might be a bit of a problem. <laughs> sure. So, um, well, it, Rob Romano's now got a test. He's gonna he's gonna make something by next week and he'll say, Yep, this is how you use a fucking vacuum gauge on this or whatever. He'll yeah, and a high voltage system, 100 percent He'll come up with something or someone else, you know, someone on the garage network will make something. I feel like <laughs> are you laying down a challenge, are you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Someone'll come up with a Yeah. Oh, that's right. So all right. So all right, that got you diagnostic stuff. Um now you're now you're also doing some other stuff now, so you've had a bit of a career change. Yes, so I had a, a big career change. Uh, do you want me to get into why? Well, yes, sure. Why not? Okay, so what, what is it? What is the career well, change? You better tell everyone what you've done. What have you done? Pardon? You better tell everyone what you've done. What is the career change? So the career change is uh, I'm a, I'm still. Classified as casual, but I've got a full-time teaching load at the, at the TAFE now, so I'm doing light vehicle and auto electrical teaching. Awesome. Congratulations. Um, thank you very much. It's, it's different. Um, so the, the purpose of the career change, it was only the start of this year that I actually took on the, the role. Um, like I said, I took over as the service manager at my old work, and that got old pretty quick doing the, the invoicing and the warranty and the the formatting and all the all of the stuff all at once. When I, I really had no idea what I was doing, I was just sort of learning as I went. Um, the previous service manager just, just had it all in his head, so I just had to. I just started. Do you Yeah. Um, yeah, I got tired of that pretty quickly, so I actually applied for a job somewhere else. Um, but seeing as no one at my workplace. Um, could do any of that diagnostic stuff because most of them, like, they didn't have the tools to do it. Um, they asked me to stay and they, you know, offered me some money and things and, yeah, so I stayed. But I, I didn't, I went out of the service manager role, they hired somebody else. And for a while I was sort of just um, doing my own, I, I, I considered myself just my own bay in the workshop. So I, I wasn't really doing any services or anything unless I was really required to. It was mostly just, you know, book this car in and I'll I'll look at it and then that person can fix it and that sort of stuff. Mostly it was just diagnostics. And I I, I really enjoyed that. And um, credit to the, the dealership I was at, um, for a while we were basically bringing in anything we could, like anything I asked to bring in. So they, like, yeah, we, nice. like we had as much as their, you know, piece of crap, we had a couple of Fiat's and Jeep's and, Things that you wouldn't normally see at a dealership. Stuff that break. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, one of the last jobs I actually did was I broke a glow plug in a um, Fiat Ducato head. So, you know, that was fun. Um, and then, then you're like, all right, guys, I quit. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, Gary, um, can, I ask you, can I ask you, so you were doing all that diagnostic work at the dealership. Yeah. And they were comfortable. So they, they were. you were just saying, yeah, give me more, give me more. It's fine. I'll keep, we'll, we'll keep going with it. Is that sort of... But did they supply you with the equipment for that, or would did you have? No. To, so it was your scope. It was your. Yeah. It was, uh, your, so your I'm only plan. using at the moment. I'm only using the, the the hand tech still. I'm just waiting for some some cash, and then I've, yeah. I've promised Ben at Mount Auto that I'm getting that PK. So, um, yeah. but yeah, so that that toolbox in the back, plus the one you're sitting on, the laptops on another toolbox, like it's probably seventy five thousand dollars worth of tools. Yeah. Um, and that's all my stuff. Yeah. There wasn't there wasn't really much supplied by the dealer. Like there was obviously this the uh, Ford and Kia scan tools. Um, but other than that, there wasn't that was credit, credit credit to them. Yeah. I mean, 
I think they should have probably backed you a bit more. I reckon that would have been nicer. As a business owner, I would have been like, I would have backed you more with that. But credit to you for wanting to take on saying, give me more diagnostic work and then taking yeah. other marks that they wouldn't have felt comfortable with. Like, you yeah. know, like that, 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 that's out of their comfort zone. I mean, I, I would assume. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we, we really only have one. We had one subscription to a, to like an aftermarket information and it, it probably wasn't the, uh, I won't give the name. It was it's good, but it's more for just servicing information. It's not technical yeah. information so much so much. Um, but yeah, for a while I was just acting as my own person, doing doing my own thing. I like I said, I occasionally did other things, but um, I was formatting at the same time. So if anyone else needed help with diagnostics and stuff, I I helped them. I I really wanted what my vision was. Cause like I said, I was happy there doing that. What my vision was, was I wanted that workplace to be the hub of Mudgy, like, oh, okay, oh, yeah. we can't fix it, so send it to that workshop yep. and then they'll be able to do it. I, that's what my vision was. I really wanted it to be that, not just a dealership. I'm really, really sick of people thinking dealerships are crap, so I, I wanted it to be the hub of Mudgy. Um, and it just every time I – so this is where it's dusted. I'm just going to sound like a sook. But every time I um, – I felt like I did something that was good to some random car or whatever. But there was someone else in the workshop, um, usually a specific person, who uh, you know cost us a thousand dollars in a customer each week. And it's like, oh, and the <coughs> the, um, the administration like one step forward, two step back, sort of thing. Yeah, it was um, it was very frustrating. Um, well, not not particularly on your job, but just on another job or somewhere else. It would just yeah, not on my job. No, 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 it's a separate job. So this particular person is a is a master technician um, with thirty plus years experience in the trade, and just the mistakes that were happening were just, in my opinion, were just unacceptable of somebody that should have been at that level. And you know, every time I got a pay raise, that person got a pay raise because I got a pay raise because they're the they were the head person like they were the the master tech so that was pretty frustrating and then um we got there was one car we got um our asses kicked a bit because i you know, i just i don't claim to be perfect i i don't know i don't make any didn't make any mistakes on it but i couldn't figure out the problem for a while that happens to everyone <laughs> yeah so none, I, um, none, of us, none of us are perfect again don't worry <laughs> yeah so it was it was on a jeep um Anyway, it just it just took too long, and then the the higher ups decided, righto, no more jeeps, and then it was all right, no more this, and then no more that, and then it's okay. Well, we're just doing this, and we're just doing that, so that's that's boring, and we're not doing anything I want to do. And um, a part of the agreement of me staying was um, that I don't have to do any of the like I'll occasionally answer a phone or whatever. You know, I was just sick of doing that. I did it for eighteen months. And I was doing, I'll just sound like a whinger again. I was doing about from six in the morning till about 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night. And the times before eight in the morning, eight in the morning and five and after five o'clock, I wasn't getting paid for. Yeah, wow. So it was just, it got old really quick and I didn't, didn't want to do that anymore. Um, yeah. So um, that was part of the agreement. I didn't have to do any office stuff. Like I, I'm happy to help, like give some, give some help if he's got some questions or something, the new service manager. Um, but they wanted me to take over more responsibility and start doing more things. And I thought that's, that wasn't the agreement. Like, that's, mm. that's why you take away all the cars I want to fix and then you send me back into the office. That's not what I want to be doing. Yeah, and I think that's really important for people, for, for other people listening to this, to go that that's what you, like you said, that's what you agreed for. You can't just, it's not a take, take, take relationship in, no. in businesses. As um, a business owner, it's a give and take relationship. I think even as business owners, that's right. We have to remember it is a two way street. Yeah, I will. And, owners, yeah. and I, I've got, I mean, I, I mean, similar things have happened to some of my staff who were foremen at, at other shops, and they they just want to be technicians. They got sick of yeah. dealing with customers. I'm not mentioning anyone's names. But that's fair though. That's, that's a fair thing to do. With customers, all they signed up for was to be a technician, and they went. To be a foreman, to be dealing with customers and being in that foreman role where they were dealing with customers and explaining what they were doing to every car every day and just got fed up with that part of that role. And they just said, this isn't what I signed up 
This is a gaming um, mechanic. Yeah, I will um, give. I will. I won't completely trash talk the old workplace. <laughs> they, they never. They never asked me to come in early or stay late. It was just that's what I. If if I didn't, just the work was. It would just be there again tomorrow, and I just thought, well, yeah. if, I, if I don't stay and do it, it's just not going to get done. So I'll just. No, that, do that's that. your work. That's, so your, that's They didn't your, tell me to do it, so. That's just your work ethic. That's your work ethic. That's your work ethic. And that's and that's that's the 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 reality of that is is you sign up to be a technician and and I you know like I mean I I had that that argument with my dad because I was managing other things for the family from remediation to development proposals to put myself out of a job. And I would be like, I just signed up to work on cars. I don't need to be doing all this. But the reality is, is I didn't want to leave that with him. So we ended up I ended up doing and my or my uncle and and the role was there and I did it and you do the job and that's just what it's it's crap. Right. Yeah. And it's like you know, I, I don't want to be here. And it's lucky for me, I couldn't leave. It was my dad, it was family. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, you're you're lucky that you can just walk you, you can, well, you feel like you can and you had another job to go to, which is great. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so in in twenty twenty when in the end of 2020, about August, September, I was I was doing one day a week at the TAFE doing just TVET teaching and, and occasional trade classes if there was a teacher away. Um, so I sort of had a, a taste of what TAFE was like before I had to take the whole plunge, but I didn't actually know what I was doing when I took the when I stepped into the TAFE role. It was very, very different than one day a week. Um, but yeah, so that that wasn't it was it was it was a big career change, but yeah, that that was the decision behind it. I just I I was pretty I was it upset me that nobody else there saw the vision I wanted to have as that business as the, the central hub of the place that can fix anything. Like I know, I know I can't fix everything, but I I want to try to anyway. I want to see if I can, and then if I can't, then well, I'll figure out why I couldn't and <laughs> try again. And learn from that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I just there's nobody seemed to share that um that vision. Look, and, and you know what? That's also fine. Sometimes if, if visions don't match, sometimes it's okay to, to separate. Like it's what it is. Yeah. You know, if, if you're not in the same direction, it's a nice yeah, vision. It's a nice vision. That's well, a nice yeah. vision. Yeah. I, I get. I Who's get. The, there's a there's a workshop there's a workshop around Foster Way that's got that vision and is doing that, which we'll talk to you know. Yeah, he's doing it very well. Well, I mean, that's sort of your your vision as well, isn't it, Mike? That's sort of your you're trying to do. They're trying to do everything in house as well. Yeah, we we well we I've, we've gone for the one stop shop, but I mean, you know, but but again, it, it, I I, I I didn't realize rural Australia sounds mudgy to me. Is not doesn't sound so rural. It's not that far away from us in Sydney. Yeah. Um, as much as it is a long drive for you to go home when we have drinks <laughs> <laughs> in Newtown uh, <laughs> at Christmas, but. Um, the the yeah I, I get that I think that's a fantastic vision I think there's one or two shops in country towns that or in, or in regions around around the state especially New South Wales that are very very good at doing diagnostics and people come from a from a wide range and and there's a, a shop in Foster where they go from Tamworth from Newcastle to Tweed Heads. Yeah, to go to him to get the jobs done, and he's like, you know, forty-five cars a day. Yeah, right. And you just go, it just blo- I Yeah, I. It, it's um, it, it's they they just they're drawn from such a massive area because you're very good at what you do. It's a bit of a necessity as well. I mean, over that such a large you know large area to cover. I mean, it, it's a bit of a necessity to have that shop that can do it all. Yeah, it's it's a yeah, I, and, and I I'd like to be able to say that yeah, we could do that in Sydney. I mean, there's a lot of customers in Sydney. There's a lot mm-hmm. of cars in Sydney. I mean, there's one thing to service your local area, but there's another thing to become a very yeah, very. I think one thing you forget about, Mike, is space. Can you yeah. fit forty five cars a day? I oh, know I couldn't. No, no, no but, <laughs> but, but, I mean, look, yeah, no, I can't. That's that's he's drawing over such a massive area that Chad's drawing. Over, that that's it's. Yeah, it's out of this world. That's a whole. I want to go and have a look. I know we, we've got to go. as soon as lockdown's over, I'm going to have a look. But, 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 uh, yeah. Uh, again, I totally get your vision. I love the vision. I love it. Can you go? Who's doing your job there now? That's all I'm going to ask. Um. So the the person that actually took over me was my apprentice 
and he's qualified now. So I will give a shout out. He's part of the TGN group too, Robbie Oakley. Yeah, awesome. Um, he's he's going really well. He's starting to get into the scopes and stuff. So he'll probably do a better job than I did. <laughs> he's, he's yeah, he's he's definitely he's definitely one to watch out for all the like videos coming out and things on TGN. I mean, if it was, if it was uh, one of your apprentices, can't be too bad. Yeah, come on, Robbie. Yeah. Wants the videos, mate. TGN Tech Tips. They're, they're up again. You can win a fuel pressure test. No, we're running. <laughs> How did you find that that um that bit of a? Obviously, you had an apprentice. You had a bit of training with them. How did you um making that change? You know, from tech to now standing in front of people and teaching. How did you find that? So, so I got a little bit of experience from having the one apprentice of the questions just come from way left field, like <laughs> way left field. They just sort of, okay, well, I don't know the answer to that. I'll just have to, oh, yeah, I'll talk about that in a minute and then go and figure it out. And come yeah. back. <laughs> um, the Having you know, 15 apprentices at once ask you these questions is, um, it can be pretty challenging. <laughs> yeah. it's, a, it's a very different scenario. It's a very different scene. Um, but I, yeah, the, it's been a pretty good experience so far. I don't like any of the paperwork. I was talking to you about that before, Costa, how many pieces of paper we go through. That's uh, so we go I think online, that, that's a, I think that's a, um, a, a teaching across the board of every industry, yeah. I believe, though. So I think that's keep, um, record keeping is um, a must. Yeah. Um, but just the, like some of the subjects, it's, it's really f- uh, fun for me to do because it, just gives me the practice that I, like in a, in a workshop, you don't always get to, like the other week I did diesel engine management and not all the time you get to work on diesel engine management and for a whole, for two weeks, um, mm. that's what that's what I taught. And I, you know, was scoping things and showing how how to do these pressure tests and that, it was just, it was just fun to um, to do that. And then now it's, I feel like it's a grain in my head. I can't forget it because I had to teach 30 people how to do it. So I'm not gonna forget it anytime soon. So you definitely well, learn a lot. See, that's one thing that I'll probably touch on that as well. Like, I think before I find, now that you've taught it, does it feel like it makes you a better tech as well? Yeah, definitely. I definitely have a better understanding of it. Yeah. I, going into the lesson at first, um, you do you, you know, you do your prep time and you go, oh, yeah, well, I'll just go flick through this. And like, oh, I, st- I still don't know how that works. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> have, having to explain it and get all these random questions because some of the students are pretty clever. Um, you, you you have to you have to at least be able to regurgitate the information. If you don't understand it, you have to at least be able to say it, and that yeah. helps you. Um, and being able to explain it in a way that different students understand makes you understand it better. Because you know, just just reading it or something's different than a student doing it and going, "Oh yeah, okay, well, I'll flip this around or put this." You know, yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a different experience, but it that helps you learn. Well, I think that I think if you have to explain things simply and also in different ways, I think it it makes you make sure that you know the, what you're training very well. It's yeah. easy to use acronyms and and things to people that understand, but when you're talking to someone who has zero experience and you've got to dumb it down, write down, I think yeah. you then have to learn it from the basics. It's pretty different. I found yeah. it I found it quite challenging to be honest. Like initially I was like, Think you know it all, then you start reading about why things happen. Like, oh crap, I don't remember this. Yeah, you know, I think it does help. It does help. Yeah. Now, so obviously, so you're training mostly guys from independent workshops, I dare say. Um, yeah, there's a fair few independents, but a lot of them are. There's a lot of dealerships as well, because in Dubbo, there's oh, I don't even know how many dealerships. To be honest, there's probably six. Um, and so we're from. We train from all sorts of places, like a like a six hundred k radius, pretty much like from all sorts of places, like Cobar and Burke and yeah. Broken Hill and people from everywhere. So there's people from mines, there's people from dealerships and independents, there's people that are not an apprentice at all and they're just paying for themselves to go through the course, uh, school based yeah. apprentices, things like that. So you get to see them from all different things. So can yeah. you now say that um, all dealer techs are crap and that the um, yeah, all they do is change pollen filters all day and, and the independence of the vest. Surely, yeah. <laughs> surely that's what you're going to say, right? Yeah, that's what I say to them all the time. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I try where do you think that time. comes from, right? Like, where do you think that comes from? Because I find that so hilarious. Whenever I see 
people going on about, oh, you know, dealers this and, and independence that. Like, look, I understand the big scale competition between independent businesses and dealer businesses because they they're in competition. Yeah. But I still have a bit of a hard time understanding the tech versus tech situation. Yeah. I can understand the business versus business because they've got different models to the models we run. But I'm trying to figure out the tech versus tech situation. Yeah. <laughs> I, I really don't know. And even the business versus business, when I was at the dealership, um, I know a lot of the conversations I see, not, not so much on TGN, but other groups, uh, oh, you know, I'm trying to get this information in the Dealer won't say, so where do I buy it from? Uh, I, I, other than copyright laws, I was happy to just, you want some information on transit, you fix that transit. You know, I don't care. Yeah. You want this, you know, you want a time belt diagram or talk specs for this, you, yeah, here you go. I'll take 10 minutes out of my day and I'll print it out or email it to you or whatever. I don't care. Have it. Like yeah. like, like we've had conversations about before, there's there's enough cars for everybody to fix. I don't, I don't really understand. Like if somebody else is busy, I'm still going to be busy. Um, even in a, in a fairly rural town, um, with the with the I don't two two minds in the dealer versus independent. I do understand that dealers are trained in usually one or two brands only because I, I did a fair bit of Kia specific training, um, but I I've since realised all oh, that actually applies to everything. Car is um, a car. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, but I do understand most of the time, you know, if, if I saw a lot of failures on, you know, specifically, oh, you know, ranges, but everybody sees failures on ranges, but I see <laughs> lots of failures on ranges and, you know, those sort of cars and not so much on, you know, a Land Cruiser or a Patrol or, a, you know, whatever. Um, so I do understand that an independent gets more variety, um, but I, I, I don't know how that reflects in ability. Mm. Uh, like I've most of the, I can think of every test I've ever done on any Ranger or any Kia. I can also do on any Hilux or you know any Corolla or anything. I can do it on any car. I, I, it transfers, yeah, transfers as well. I think I think it's more the I think it's more the 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 level. Of, well, I think I think it very no different to the independent world. It very it, it varies very much between what dealer you're at. Or what yeah. independent workshop you're at, and what sort of training you have. I mean, yeah. one of the one of the biggest gripes I've had, which is why I pushed for certificate twos, was because we had tire changes who were becoming qualified mechanics, and they had only ever worked at a Bridgestone tire shop. Mm. They may have done That's a really good point. Yeah, right. They, they had they they had been changing literally. They were very good at changing tires and very good at doing services, but they couldn't. They outside of that range of of, of jobs, they were no good at doing anything else. Yeah. Yeah. They were. They were coming through apprenticeship. Uh, they, they were mainly. Uh, this this sounds terrible, but uh, this is. They were mainly employed by group training or like uh, not group training organisations. Like we know the ones you mean. Yep. Like eight, yeah. Yeah, the, yep. the ones you mean. Yep. The people, the hiring, the the apprenticeship the, hiring hiring. Yes. Company, um, and they would hire them specifically to those those uh, tire shops, but I think. I think probably the perception. I mean, I've been independent for thirty years. So when we look at that, I don't see any. I don't see the 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 the, the dealerships worrying about us, uh, and I don't personally worry about dealerships. There Same is enough me. cars for all of us to go around. There is so many cars on the road. The problem that I see is that dealerships structure themselves to be servicing cars that are not to forty thousand kilometers, yeah. or forty to fifty thousand kilometers. Uh, and that's all those techs are usually doing in the city. Once those cars get to five years old, which for us is fifty thousand k's out of or thirty thousand k's out of warranty, yeah. they don't. They're not doing any other work to them. So they don't get too much exposure around the city. Around the city, anyways, I don't think they get too much exposure to well, other than service high kilometer cars. Yeah. yeah so so, so they, they never do a clutch. They never do a. You know what I mean? Like they're not. They're not getting exposure to those other sorts of jobs. So I suppose. Maybe, maybe when you get it into the, into the, out into the in rural or out, you get out into the west of Sydney, you might get cars that need a clutch or need a transmission or need other work once they get older. So I think mm. there's a there's a big there's a big. I think a lot of it depends on where you are. Obviously, yeah, that's right. Yeah. You're probably right. You know. Yeah. Um. So yeah, that's definitely 
very different from my experience at the dealer. Oh, um, you know, we're servicing cars, two, 300,000 Ks on them. have had three or four clutches, two engines, you know, yeah, well. all sorts of stuff. Um, we're, we're still, there's a, there's a particular Subaru Forester with, uh, I think it's got 440,000 Ks on it now on its original engine, actually. I don't know how that happens. I, so, don't, be- um, I don't believe it. I know. I don't believe it. <laughs> but like, yeah, we get cars like that all the time and, um, yeah, it's, it's definitely, it's definitely, you know, everywhere's so far away, so you can't, you know, well, cars that, don't that, just get 10,000 cars on them. That sounds like they're the sorts of cars we service, Costa would service, or I would service. That's yeah. what we would normally, we would, but I, I guess, I guess the, the, the problem is, is where, where you start to see the issues is we employ these guys and these guys, some of them have gone, oh, I've never done that before. And you're still yep. like, okay. And, and it's not their fault. They've just never been exposed to that sort of job. And you can't, yeah. no one begrudges that. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, I mean, I'll, I'll put my hand up and, and be the first one to say that we go, it's a dealer service car. There is no way they've checked the cabin filter on that because the, because the logbook doesn't say to check it till 40,000 Ks. And we know, and I know that they'll be dirty at 20,000, you know, and, and uh, we've had, we have funny, I think, one of my boys has bet the other boy lunch for a week that it's going to be dirty. And he said, no, it's not you for another 10,000. And, and, you know, Kyle's told, I'll, I'll put him down to this. Kyle's told Naoki, pull it out. Naoki's he's going, no, it's not you for 10,000. Kyle's going, I'll bet you lunch for a week. It'll, it'll, <laughs> it'll be it. And he says, I want lobster. <laughs> and he pulls it out and it was absolutely chockers full of leaves. Yeah. Uh, but you sort of just go, look, you know, I mean, it's, it's, again, it's, it's, but- so I won't I won't speak for all dealers or even the dealer everybody at the dealer I was at. Trust me that uh, I I checked the pollen filters and everything every time, but that definitely didn't happen on, in everyone's bay. Um, some um, yeah, one, that person I was having a whinge about before, like one of the reasons that he, in my opinion, that he still has a job. Trust me, he's not on TGN, so I don't have to worry about anything. Um, <laughs> One of the re- definite reasons he has a job still is because he can do a service in you know twenty five minutes. So, but then they still charge an hour. So he's making them more money. Productivity up through the roof. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. when they um, when he makes a thousand dollar mistake, you know he's made them two thousand dollars in services. Yeah. Which is not the right <laughs> thing to do. But I mean, no discredit to to the boy for for guys. If you don't have time to do that in the time that they do it, they need to be more efficient, and they need to be trained to be more efficient, and they need to be trained to be able to do that service in that hour or whatever it is, or forty five minutes, yep. to, to to whatever they're charging to do that service. And and I guess there's no, I don't know. I think it's. I, I think I, in, I think what it is, Mike, is well, we got. I think in the independent world, we had to have the luxury of, well, at least in your case, my case, of, of making the rules. So we can sort of design, if we want one and a half hours for a service, two hours for a service, we can make that call. And like you said, because we're not really too concerned about what the dealers are doing, we just build what we want to build as what's a part of our service for our business. Yes. yes you yes. know, we're not guided by, man. well, we are. We follow manufacturer stuff also, obviously, but if we want to add an extra half an hour because we want to check extra things, we can make that call. You know, um, and your text obviously from there will follow what you say. Very yeah, similar loosely, thing, you know. And loosely guided. I mean, I guess that that's the problem. With, that was the problem with fixed price servicing. The biggest problem hasn't been, it's not the tech so much. It's probably what the dealers, have, uh, the, the, the confines they've put around what you've got to do in that fixed price service. And there's, yeah, there's, that, not much, there's definitely not much leeway in no. some of the fixed price servicing, uh, especially for for cost and things. And the, and the Part of the problem is if the customer has a list, which all they have to do is Google the list of how much their service is, and say uh, on a Ranger, I think a like a I don't know forty. Oh, sorry, let's go thirty thousand k service. So that has a fuel filter on it. It's like five hundred and five dollars or something. And then you want to put an air filter in it because it's absolutely filthy. They know it's supposed to be five hundred dollars, and an air filter is you know seventy dollars or something. They're just going to go what? No, this is coming under this. Oh, dealerships are crap. I'm taking it. Yeah, that's right. Derek needs That's, that's what your car needs. We're just, yeah. yeah. All the dealers always hit me off. Yeah. Yeah, we can't that we can't fit that into the cap price as well, because then like we're losing $40. It's yeah. not, not possible. Um, that was that's the other thing with um just I'm uh, just ad-libbing here. With um 
warranty work and things like that. So I know a lot of I know a lot of dealer techs, and I work with one that just fires the parts cannon all the time, and that's what that's what I've seen the perception of dealers are. But in reality, because I've been on the warranty end of somebody firing the parts cannon, and that's that's really bad business because you can't if you can't claim it, you pay for it. So yeah. parts cannon gets fired if if the PCM doesn't fix it and it's a $150 math sensor, then you still pay for the PCM. Like, yeah, right. So you, you do have to get it right or you pay for it, So, which is the same as what you guys do. That's right. But it's, uh, it's, it's yeah, it's just different. It's I, mean, the, what the I don't think the, part, I don't think the parts kind of change the thing from whether it's a dealer or a, um independent. But I think some independents might believe that just because the dealer does it, they don't pay for it. I think it still comes out of someone's purse. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Someone's got to pay for it somewhere. Whether it's, it somewhere. it's the boss somewhere, someone's paying for it, and it's. Right. You know, I'm, yeah, I'm assuming the manufacturer is not too happy about that. Well, no, no, <laughs> they they fight pretty hard, so they don't have to pay for anything. Mm. Absolutely. Usually, even if you are right. <laughs> <laughs> even if you are right. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Yeah, so you're still arguing with them anyway. Yeah. So they're not a, they're not a, they're not an easy going customer. <laughs> yeah, you got uh, No, you, you do a client um, shock absorber that was leaking. They had they had like a hundred and can you guys still hear me? It says my yeah, no, you're good, you're good. Yeah. To clean up. Okay. Um, yeah, it said uh, so. The it was a Ford Ranger. It had a leaking shock. The car had like a hundred thousand four hundred Ks on it, so their warranty is one hundred was one hundred thousand at the time. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll put the claim in because it's four hundred Ks over. Come on, we're and there. I, I honestly, I honestly fought for that for four months, wow. and it was like two hundred and forty dollars. I didn't even try and claim the labour. I just said, right, I just, just, just pay for the part, and they, I, I didn't end up winning. They just said wow. no. Wow. It was like two hundred. That, look, that's surprising to me. I'll be honest. That's, that's surprising to me. I just assumed, and this is again me just assuming that you know you make a mistake. Yeah, there's some leeway in there, you know. But that's that's interesting. I didn't we know actually that. there was a there was a Ford Ranger again, yeah, um, where it was a an EGR cooler had failed. So this was on I think it had failed on the twenty eighth of December, and the person's warranty ran out on the thirtieth of December. So we opened the job on the twenty eighth. But we didn't finish it until you know January third or something. Mm. But because that person's warranty had run out in between the times of the fo- beginning and finalising of the job, we had to claim it as a different claim type, as an out of warranty type. Like wow. no, it was started within warranty. <laughs> but it, that took months to get that money as well. Like the the person was like a goodwill, like a goodwill warranty sort of situation, did it? Yeah, it was just. Yeah. It was. It was. You know, that's. That's seven, eight thousand dollars worth of engine stuff and labor and and everything, and um, that's a lot. It's a lot of money to deal with as a service rider, like you know, and, yeah. and 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 like even with some of the the college training that I do, I always remind the te- the apprentices that keep in mind, like when you're giving job cards back to your bosses, when you're when you're when you have broken something, keep in mind that, that your service advisor is the one making that call. <laughs> <laughs> He's gonna have to make the call to the angry customer who needs their car at three o'clock, and yeah. also to the big bosses upstairs that you know one of his techs has broken something. Um, yeah. I think we can all do a better job with that sort of communication. Yeah, that was the that was probably the main thing about the warranty. Like I've been whinging about the warranty, but um, from my experience, at least, I, I was happy if somebody came in with a genuine problem. I was happy to just go, yeah, sure, we'll I'll get warranty to pay for it. Look it out, um, but. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of dealers aren't like that, and some of them don't want to pay for things, and it's too much paperwork. Um, <laughs> but most of the time, it's like like I never make the decision on what is and isn't warranty. Like I'll put the claim in for anything, but if it gets knocked back, that's not me. That's not the dealer knocking it back. It's the warranty department knocking it back of that manufacturer. Like yeah. it's not not the person at the desk that they're screaming about that you know the stitching's coming off their steering wheel. I didn't yeah. say no to that. That was that guy. Yeah. That was someone else behind a sitting behind a desk that doesn't know you. Yeah, right. So it's actually a good point as well. I have had, I have had some recently. I've had some dealers charging two hundred and fifty dollars just to put the warranty claim in. They want a what? labor. They want a labor charge. There's certain dealers in Sydney that uh, Subaru dealers. 
that uh, that would like to they they won two hundred and fifty dollars just to put the claim in. And they refunded yeah. if it gets approved. No, they just left it on the bill, and then they interesting. And, and that was on a transmission on a on a, a and the customer decided, no, I'm not going to take the risk. Yeah, okay, yeah, so well. mine. They're because oh, yeah. it takes them an hour and a half to put the paperwork in. They're gonna, they want, they, and it was, it was another, it was an out of warranty, thirty thousand k, literally like six months out of warranty. The car had done thirty thousand k's. It was a non, not fit for purpose claim, is what it would have been under fair trading. But yeah. it just was like, look, is it worth spending two hundred and fifty dollars on that, or are we better to put the two fifty just towards fixing it? And it, they would, they wanted to strip the car down, send the gearbox away. Um, mm-hmm. And and it just to just to put the claim in was an additional two hundred and fifty dollars. Wow, that's crazy. So so when I talk about no, not all dealers are crap. Maybe it's just the one I was at. <laughs> <laughs> How are well, your turns around? Your yeah, story is wild. Well, I'm not. I, I'm not. <laughs> I, I'm not saying all dealers are crap, and I'm not saying you know like it's, they're they're about to get a bit of a shock. I think a lot of the they've been very they've been a protected species, I, I believe, as far as yeah you know, yeah. I'm uh, excited for this new legislation. the freedom of information stuff that ARCA and the AAA have got through for us is absolutely fantastic. Yeah. And that's gonna in the next in the next six months now or eight months or whatever it's going to be till July next year, the the car park is the the games at the goalpost for us are really going to get moved. And the halfway points there for us, and and we're going to get a lot more access to a lot more stuff. It's going to be yep. really, really good. Do you reckon that's going to change your um? That's going to change your teaching. Yeah. Considering now we're going to have access to um, manufacturer that'll, stuff. That'll make it a lot easier. There'll be less um, pirating of information from some of the students. I think oh, <laughs> we wouldn't. We would never. No, no, no. I mean, anyways. there'll be. Uh, other I've heard of it happening. I've heard of it happening <laughs> from other people. Choose my words carefully here. <laughs> yeah, and no, I've heard of it happening from other people. We can like edit that. that out. That's okay. That's it. Naughty, yeah. naughty. Yeah, yeah. We wouldn't do that. Um, That's right. Yeah. So in saying that, so how how do you reckon the teachers are at um, JS twenty five thirty four programming? Pardon? How do, uh, how are the teachers? Um, I can tell you from uh, my experience, not many teachers have done it. Oh, no, I'm just going to say, Gary couldn't no. hear it. No, sorry, Gary. Yep. The J2534 programming. The pass-through. Pass-through programming or knowing anything about card yeah, app no. or about Drew Technologies, about Bosch, all the guys. Bosch and all of the, all of the different different stuff that we, we you know, some of us have been using for nearly eight years now. Well, years. Gary's yeah, well, had the Bosch pass-through, so, I mean, you, yeah. you know, yeah. Some of the teachers um, have an idea about it. Um, they're definitely not using it. Um, the head teacher there, um, he's he's. Where I, I seem to so TGN is a group of overachievers at, <laughs> at the tape on that as well. They're they're another bunch like that too. They're all um, all the light vehicle and auto electrical teachers are all a bunch of overachievers as well. They're all always making things or doing something, doing crazy things. Um, so the head teacher there has done some pass through stuff. Um, I want to put it in as a, as a part of the lesson. So with the auto electrical, you know, we did some tuning, as in you, you were able to, you know, use your um, uh, whatever it was called. It was one of them was Haltech, one of them was something else. We were able to go in and change some information and and um, you know, you know, change shift points in gearboxes and things like that. But it was pretty basic sort of stuff. And I want to add pass through on top of that because that's something you will actually use. Like a person doesn't yeah. really need to know how to use, how to change it. Well, me at least. I'm talking about just me, so it's all about me. <laughs> doesn't doesn't need to know how to, you know, tune a car. And that's not really a huge interest of mine. But pass through is something that you need to know how to do. Because um, yes. being at a dealer, I know how many cars are f- fixed by software updates and, and things like that. Agreed. Um, and being able to swap PCMs around and and things, so like it's it's something that needs to be taught. Well, especially yeah. once they're going to have access to it, there's no reason not yeah. to, right? Like that's yeah. before we had a cop out of you know go take you know you're not going to see that, so it's okay. Yeah, but that's I mean, right. It's, it's, it's there. <laughs> it's there. We're going to have access to it. We're going to pay for that access to it, and that's you know we're going to learn how to use it. And that's yeah. I'm, you know, I'm really excited you know, about that. Um, with the, I'll just go backtrack a bit to the, to me thinking I knew everything. I I didn't even know any of this aftermarket training existed at the dealer. I thought it was, you know, you do dealer training, 
or you go to TAFE. And that's that's what I thought existed. And then on TGN, there's all these training events and stuff happening all over the place. Well, um, I'll, I'll give props to you on that. Like, you've come to a fair bit of it and then yeah. driven back home. <laughs> like, <laughs> at, at a crazy, like, drive in, drive out sort of hours. Yeah. Like, it's it's a solid effort by, like, people like yourself and even the other ones that come from quite far away to make that commitment because it is a big commitment. You know, it doesn't come to yeah, you. We're it's, paying it's, for it's, it. We're driving out of our way for it. We're normally on a weekend, so you're away from family. Yeah. Um, it's definitely worth doing, though. The, um, when I did that uh, hybrid electric vehicle with um, Scott Daly and, mm-hmm. and you guys, um, the, the, the previous three days I had done Kia training for the same subject, and the first half an hour of Scott's training was just like, oh, this is... This is so much more information than the dealer training gave me. It was just, it was, it was almost not worth going to the Kia one because there was just so much better information in the in the Bosch one. I just, I, I never knew about that extra training you could get outside of the dealer network or TAFE. Well, look, you got to look for it, Tim. I think well, that was the issue that I wish to have going through the ranks. It was quite hard finding it. I found it very difficult yeah. to find training that was that was current. I mean, I will give a big shout out to Scott, um, Scott Daly, for those that don't know, he's one of the trainers from um, that we deal with frequently. Um, trains for Bosch. Yeah, trains for Bosch. So his, his method of training, I think, is very good. Like, he's, he's definitely one of the, the better trainers I've seen. He's got a very good way at relaying a message and far out, he knows his shit really good. Shouldn't he? <laughs> knows his shit really good. Like, you can't really stump him. Like, he, he no, can't. He's, um, that was. The first one I went to, it was just like, he just blew my mind away with, with the amount of information he was delivering and how he knew it. It was crazy. And the back seat of that RAV's never been the same. Yeah. <laughs> no comments about the RAV. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, um, Scotty's a very good trainer and anyone that wants to do it, as soon as COVID lockdown's over, we'll be, we'll be back at it. I'll, I'll be hosting some more Bosch training and, and, uh, yeah, I'm happy to do it. It's really, really good. It's nice to meet everyone and nice to have everyone. I like seeing people learn, so, you know, and the networking is really good. So. Yeah. And it's uh, half yeah, again, as Costa said, mate, Gary, you had a long drive home and a long drive here. So, oh, huge yeah. props. Huge props. It's a solid effort. Like, not, not many people would do it, you know, because, like I said, it's taking time away from your weekend. It's, you're paying for training and, you know, committed to make that drive there and back. It's, it's pretty serious. Like, it, it's a solid effort. Should be should be proud of yourself. It's good. Very much. It's, it's definitely worth doing. So that's that's it was an easy decision. It's like, oh, there's training on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it's good. Good that you enjoyed it. I'm glad that you got something Gary, out of it. It's actually good you. feedback. I got a question for you, Gary. Have you got a love for cars now? Or there's a bonnet up in the background behind you. So you <laughs> that's a good point. You know what? Good you, point. Like like after working in the trade for this for you know, what is it now? Ten years. More so this, is, this is my 11th year, yeah. So 11 years, have you, do you now have a passion for cars or do you just don't? It's still, it's no, just a, it's no. much food on the table. So I've asked my question that, myself that question a lot. I, I don't know if it's a passion for cars or just a passion for things and how things work. Yeah. I think cars are really good because... There's just so many things happening and you need to know how everything works. And I like knowing how things work. So I don't know if it's exactly cars. I do like some cars, but I like just stuff. I like knowing how things work and it just changes every five seconds. So it's a really good industry to be in if you like things. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't but, know about cars. But I mean, some of them are that's right. a good point. No, they're all yeah. crap. Yeah, you oh, are what's your favourite car? Just to keep, while we're on this topic, you've got to have a favourite car, surely. So... The car I unlimited funds, yeah. So this is like unlimited, one funds. That, unlimited funds, just to make it more interesting. The car I've got rusting outside at the moment was, was my project car in 2011, and it's just it's uh, just on hiatus at the moment um, for about the last nine years. Um, is a, a 1974 LA Lancer. Oh yeah, right. They're like one of the real first yeah, first real drive yeah. Lancers. Yeah, uh, nice. And was originally to put like a you know, a 4G63 turbo out of an Evo in it and make it just ridiculous. And then uh, that was a bit too expensive. So <laughs> then reality happened. <laughs> yeah. So the, the final result is, you know, put a, 
a Sigma block and a Magna head on it. So it's a fuel injected 2.6 liter and just finding the time to do that is just not possible. So it's just, we'll just sit outside for now. So yeah, with that question, with that question, board. Mike, I secretly found out he has a passion for cars. Did you see that? <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I'm the same. You, you, I, Gary and I are more alike than you think because I, I don't I really, think so. Because I, I like I've, I've, you boys G me up about it because I just I see cars are just a means to get a bigger boat or to put food on the table, <laughs> or whatever, whatever it's going to be. Um, but yeah, it's and I, I really I love his answer to that question. I think I love your answer, Gary. It's a, I have a passion for fixing things. I love things that are broken and I love yeah. knowing how they work, pulling it apart, putting it back together. And not obviously not having things left over and getting getting something that's not working <laughs> to be working. Um, and and that's that's always been that's what I've always done in dad's workshop when he was working on cars when I was a kid, when I was there after school. You know, like I'd build a billy card or I'd fix a bike or we'd do stuff like that. You know, you'd find something on the scrap heap and fix it. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I probably, but yeah, Costa, you can sit there and say that, but I've got I've got cars that if I had unlimited funds, I'd, you know, I built half a dozen FJ40 Land Cruisers and sold them, but I just did all that for the money. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> but, 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 you know, to buy a boat, yeah. Buy and sell and buy and sell and change, you yeah. know. But, I don't know. There are cars, there are things you like. It's yeah, nice, of course. nice things. Yeah. Know. I wouldn't your, know. Your Lancer project will get there. Right? You've got plenty of time now. You're a TAFE teacher. They don't do anything. How you dare you? Yeah, that's true. How dare you? I'll, <laughs> you know what? You know what I want to do one day? It's what I have him sitting with us while we're marking. Then he can oh, talk about oh, it. Oh, yeah. Rubbish. And we can have a chat about, you know, plenty of spare time. We can have a chat about just that. Invite mate. Joe. Invite Joe as well. And yeah, good idea. You, 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 you just go to school. You go to school and you have fun and you make problems and then you and you let the kids cut all the wires and bugger up all of them. <laughs> and stuff. Wreck perfectly good cars and, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, you know, it's all right. You'll get there. You've got plenty of time. Take it to TAFE and make the kids work on it. Oh, yeah, not Jesus. that simple. <laughs> not that simple. <laughs> yeah. He says, Jesus, no. It won't come back in one piece. <laughs> well, haven't you heard the joke about the, um, the well, not the joke, the, the airplane engineer? So oh. his students, his students actually built this plane from start to finish, you know, and then they're going to take it for its maiden voyage. So everyone was scared to go on the plane and the engineers, are like, the teacher was like, you know what? I'll, I'll go on the plane, no worries. And I go, well, yeah, everyone was scared to go on the maiden voyage. So everyone was like, why aren't you scared that the plane's going to drop? Because, mate, there's no chance it's going to get in the sky, so I'm not too concerned. Oh. <laughs> That's teachers. <laughs> But officially, Costa and I think the students are really good. And, I do. Um, we're, yeah, yeah. Look, I'll be honest. I'll be honest. I, I think that the students that I'm seeing coming through have a shit ton of talent, and that's not joking around anymore. There's, there's obviously, in in when you have numbers, there's always going to be the ones that, you know, don't really care as much. But as an average, I think they, they genuinely want to fix cars. They genuinely want to learn how things work and, and learn how to fix things. But I think it's a little bit more on, you know, bosses and, and, and dealers or whatever it's going to be to help and feed that want for knowledge and, and hopefully keep them happy in their job, give them some variety, just how you had a Gary, a bit of variety in their day to keep them excited about it. Like yeah. a large majority are eager at a minimum. They might not like the, the classroom as much, but they're eager to get into the workshop. Yeah, you know, and they're eager to get the job done. Are they, well, eager to get the job that, done. I, I think that's a, not disappoints me about where you were working, Gary. So, like, if I was the dealer principal, the dealer principal really could have nurtured and like helped you grow in that role and make that shop your the hub. Something else, yeah. you know, it could be, you know, and but it's it's um I guess you've got it. Like Costa said, if your vision, your vision and your path is not on the same vision and path as the as the as the as your boss, then that, that, that you're you're going to be going in different directions. It's too hard. Yeah. It's too hard. It becomes too hard, and it's easier for you to go in a, in a different direction. You still got God diagnostics. You can go back and contract it, okay? Yeah, that's that's what I'm, that's the plan. I went back and worked for him for a little bit in the uh, school holidays a few weeks ago. Yeah, cool. Um, which was wasn't too bad because I knew I could just leave if I wanted to. <laughs> so um, <laughs> when you break the next there. um the next um 
glow plug you walked out. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I, I broke another one, and I thought, no. Nah, <laughs> I just go there. Just do that. You guys, as, as teachers, you got it. You got a, a, The ultimate mentor, or ultimate person to look up to, is is Scanner Dana. I mean, oh. Paul Danner goes and gets all of the fun jobs for all of those shops all over Philadelphia and just goes out there to the, and goes to the stu- back of the students' class, like the back of the students' workshops and goes and diagnoses all their faults for them. You know, no pressure, no, yeah. you know, like it's, it's, it's you, you don't have the customer, you don't have the parts cannon, you've just got to work out what's wrong. And it's, it's, I, I yeah. I'm, I'm envious of that. It, it's one, you know, I love problems, but I hate all of the problems come when you least want them. Right, yeah, right, now, right, right now during lockdown, I'd quite happily have one or two every week. You know, we can sit there and we can, we've got the time, we can diagnose it, we can spend time on it. We're not rushed. We're not pressured. It's sort of, it sort of come in waves. You just, you think to yourself, oh, it's been a while since we've had this sort of problem and then seven of them come in. Yeah, you like, never. You never say that out loud, out loud, Gary. You never say that out loud because <laughs> they come. I, I, I said it today, cost me the whole You're day. gone, mate. I'm not saying it. I'm happy the way I am. Thank you. <laughs> I, I said it. I said it today with a Land Rover with a suspension fault, and I reckon I'm going to get inundated in the next two weeks. It'll, be, it'll, it'll just be one day. There won't be like over. We'll have nothing, 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 nothing. You know, three jobs a day or whatever it is, and then all of a sudden we'll get seven in one day. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, and it's the day you've booked in eight services. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Or and someone's sick. Services. Yeah. <laughs> and you go, oh my god, how am I? Gonna... That's when. That's when I'm gonna. I'm gonna give him a plug. That's when there's one piece of diagnostic equipment that comes into its own, which is Opus IVS. Yeah, they do well. They do well in that. Opus, that. Opus IVS comes into its own. You log a case, move on to the next car, log a case. Log a case, log a case, and you get a technician working with you to fix problems. Uh, I haven't had any experience with Opus other than what I've read. So it's fairly, from what I'm hearing, it's fairly similar to how a dealer would have a, a hotline to a... Very, very similar with the dealer stuff. So you log your case and they, they come back with you with a list of directions and instructions and what to test or even a fix, depending on, on the scenario. Yeah. Well, generally, so I did the I did the Land Rover. So we had a few jobs. I had the Land Rover today, so I logged a case with the Land Rover, um, and one of the techs rang, rang me back within about twenty minutes of logging yeah, the right. case, and then we just sat in the car. He team viewed it in. Well, that's like team viewer on the back of the tool. So he logged into the tool and goes, "Yeah, you've got a compressor fault, but you, before you do anything with the compressor, you're going to have to find the leak because you put a new compressor in. It's going to last for two weeks." Mm. Um, blah 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 blah. The location of the compressor is here. Uh, it's got a Hitachi compressor. I recommend you upgrade to an AKS compressor or maybe oh, right. um, basically just went, this is what I do and uh, and go and prepare your customer. So okay, I gotta, I gotta tell you that's that's better than the dealer one. The dealer one is read this section of the manual and do this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, right. I swear they have access to different manuals than we do as well, because sometimes I'm like, where did you get that information from? I have a search for Asians and I can't find it. <laughs> Yeah, so so that'll be interesting whether we get uh, Gary. I'm gonna I'm gonna hit you up here. I reckon uh, in the next twelve months, in, in about a year's time, I think we're gonna need people. So you're very good with Kia and Ford, and probably some. Did you do any pass through on Subaru, or did, was that did they leave before you got there? They leave left before I did a bit of that. So yeah, didn't get yeah much. we might hit you up. We might hit you up to do some. We might do some online stuff with uh, with dealer Kia specific and, dealer specific stuff with Kia and with Ford, and it. And if we can find some other, we need we need people to train everyone, or yeah. just to give you some some hints and just how to navigate all of those bits. Like Scott, like you did pass through, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was yeah. In the past, so obviously, obviously, we, we're in the independent. Well, we've never, I've never had anything to do with any of Kia's genuine software, yeah. so like, or, or or even really that much with Ford. Um, so like navigating that for us is going to be a real. It's a, it's a it's an uncharted territory. Yeah, well, with the Ford one, it's pretty easy if the tool works, which is not very often. <laughs> <laughs> Classic Ford. Oh, oh no, no. I've been listening to you, or you guys have been as well, because you were interviewed by uh, Sean Tipping on the Automotive Diagnostic Podcast. And um, 
<laughs> even he, in America, they're even talking about how you have to restart IDS and uninstall and reinstall. It's just, yeah. oh, it's just never ending. It's always some um, issue with it. It's not just you, mate. Not just you. No, it's everywhere. So what? So what next? So you've got the um, your obviously your dealership days are sort of at this point anyway is not done. Um, yep. Teaching. I think Mike just mentioned as well. You got your diagnostic. God. God. Yeah. So, diagnostics. <laughs> just about yeah, Ryan. So, just, just, so the plan is. I, I don't really know what the plan is. I'm just playing it by ear at the moment. The um, the I've organised a van. I've just got to pick it up. It's a bit of a piece of crap, um, but it's a van. It works. Look. Yeah. Um, Park it next to the Landstar. <laughs> that's <laughs> Let's right. Come back in nine years. Yeah. Uh, well, even then, still, I don't know. <laughs> um, it, it doesn't look too bad, but it's a it's a it's an older Mercedes van, so good luck to me. Um, but so the plan is to get the van and fit as many tools as I can into it without overloading it, um, and just uh, with the the time because I, I teach from Monday usually until Wednesday twelve o'clock, and then the rest of the time is marking and organising and stuff until Thursday afternoon, and so I have Friday free if I can sort of backtrack a bit and make Thursday, Friday free, I might be able to start driving around and delivering some diagnostic stuff, which I've got a couple of businesses that are like my old place I used to work at is interested in me doing that and a couple of the other little places in town, are, you know, they're pretty keen on me doing it. I want to get some more pass-through stuff so I can, I can offer that because nobody, I don't know any independent in my area that does anything like that. Yeah, well. um, so I want to be able to offer that as well. So that, Just, you can have, your, have your vision and make it you are the one to go to in town when you got yeah. a problem. Yeah, that's that's the that's the um that's the plan. Now not look not to pump your head up. I think you've got the right um the right vision. I think you've got the right your head screw on the right direction to, to be that, to be honest. I'll probably are and not just saying that because you're here. I think you like you're <laughs> definitely committed. Like making you put probably the most effort in from most guys I've seen. So I think you definitely have it in you. So no, I definitely wouldn't right. wouldn't defer from that. Right attitude and the right yeah. got the right vision. That's the right. It's a great idea. I, I love it. Yeah. That's, the, that's the idea of most of us start our businesses with. We want to be that person, and you want to be that the person that everyone goes to when they got a problem. Yeah. <laughs> See, as bad as that sounds. Yeah, I know, right? Sometimes <laughs> you don't want to be that person. Trust me. Sometimes you'd like to switch that off. But that's okay. I'll, I'll do it for a week. I'll, I'll do it for a week where everybody's angry after they. I've had trouble with it and I'm getting yelled at, and I go, you know what? This this wasn't the best idea. I don't want to do this anymore. You know what it is, Gary? Just just being that angry person that's once called the diagnostic guy to come and help me before early on in my career, remind them you're there to help. Yep. And you haven't called the situation. You're just yeah. there to help them to get through the situation. And, that's and, and you also that's get it. the luxury of being able to go. I'll, I'll diagnose it for you. You can repair it. You can pull the glow plug out. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's that's the, remind, um, yourself, remind yourself that to go, uh, this needs new glow plugs. It's a Fiat. I'm not doing that job. That's, I'm just going to diagnose it. Here's my fee. That was the tipping point of, yeah, maybe I shouldn't be fixing cars. I should just be diagnosing cars. I, <laughs> <laughs> just, I'll tell you what's wrong and you can break the glow plug. <laughs> you can break it. <laughs> With someone, that, you should have given that to the master technician. Oh, it would have been on fire, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. All right, I think... Um, was really yeah, do you have any questions for us? Um, no, I hope not. Well, so many answers. Not, <laughs> not what I can think of, really. Uh, I would like to thank you and the other admins um, just for having TGN. I, I, it's just a... I don't have another word for it other than ridiculous. And overachieving. It's just <laughs> Every, I it's love just that. a great group. Right? Overachieving. Yeah. It's not, I love it. We're not overachieving. It's just, <laughs> it's just full of people that are just so ridiculously clever. And um, it just helps drive, I, in my opinion, it helps drive the industry forward. It, help, it makes well, everybody want to do well, better. I, I'll say thank you, but I, I think you're now that it's not really, look, don't get us wrong, the admin due to a bit of work, but it's not the admins that make the page. It's the guys that are in it. And I think it's the guys yeah. that are in it that are driving, making us want to do more as well. The more we see 
them doing cool shit or cool stuff, sorry, um, we tend to want to then <laughs> do more as well because, like, none of the admins actually make any money from it. Just a lot of time that goes into it, right? Uh, it's, it's probably the worst possible business model ever. Um, <laughs> but but you know what? When we when like you say stuff like that, or you see people actually, you know, taking the time to post cool stuff on there, it makes it all worth it in my eyes, anyways. Yep. I mean, Look, no, when we hear, when, I'll be honest. When we when I hear things like that, and and but that's lovely to hear. Thank you. But yeah. we don't. We we you know like we, we it's, it's not us. It's the it's it's the people we've let in, and it's the and the people that we've kept. Yeah. Yep. They keep the page going, and the people that contribute. The page is the page. I think. I think a lot of that's got to be. I mean, I don't do a lot of it, but a lot of that comes down to vetting people that are coming on the page and keeping mechanics on the page, and keeping good people on the, yep. and letting good people in the page, and not, yeah. you know, keeping making sure it's only mechanics and it's only te- you know only technicians and only um, and only people business people. mindset. Yeah, yeah. People, people that are in the trade because. The page can fall apart if you if if it starts getting opened up to everyone. I know everyone can listen to this, but unfortunately, the garage network is only open to mechanics and business owners in yeah. the automotive industry. Look, there might be some people listening to this actually. So the garage network, the actual core element of it is, is a private group for techs and and people that work in workshop in some sort of professional capacity, right? Um, I'm sure this is going to go on YouTube. There's going to be uh, a podcast. So don't forget us when you're worldly famous. Um, Gary, um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, for the ones that do hear this, you know, it, it's 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 not for everyone. It's, it's not, not for everyone. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, don't well, get me wrong. I'll put that nicely. You know, it's not for everyone. It's only for 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 people in the automotive industry. Yeah. Not for not for reps. It's for you know. That, not for that, DIYers. Like, don't get me wrong. DIYers, cool. You want to fix your own cars? No problem. Um, but if it's on a professional capacity, well, that's not what we're there for. You know. Yeah. yeah. But um, no, look, means a lot, Gary. It means a lot. Yeah. yeah, no, it means a lot. It does mean a lot. To us, so. yeah. We'd like to say a huge thank you to Gary Rean for joining us on this episode. Don't forget to join our private Facebook page if you are an automotive technician and also subscribe to our YouTube and our podcast channel. They are all called The Garage Network. Thanks, guys, and see you next time.